Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to tell you the story of this uh, German helmet and gas mask uh, that were given to me in southern France and the research I was able to do uh, into them. So firstly, people contact me quite often because they find uh, helmets with names painted inside them like this and they want to find out who the helmet belonged to. This is another example here, how helmets often have names inside. And that usually isn't possible because the, the simple fact is that many German soldiers uh, would have the same family name because there were millions of them. And so if all you have is a family name, well then there's no way of knowing usually which one of the 50 or 100 soldiers it would have belonged to who had that family name. So usually research is only possible if either the name is extremely rare or else if there's more information, if there's a unit written down, a first name, stuff like that, or if you have some context about where the helmet was, was originally found. If you know it, it was found in a precise location, then maybe you can match it to, to a soldier who's known to have been in the area. And here's an example. You see here there's a soldier whose name was Anton Rodoschek, which doesn't sound like a very common name, and uh, he died in, uh, in Cannes on August 15th, 1944. And you would think, oh, well, if I find a helmet with the name Anton Rodoschek written inside it uh, in this area, then I know for sure it's his helmet. But actually, you look at this other grave, and there's another guy called Anton Rodoschek, and he died on, uh, on August 28, 1944, in Nice, so just beside Cannes. And so you see he has the exact same name, was in the same division, was in the same area, uh, was the same age, came from the same region in Slovenia. And actually, uh, if you found a helmet with this name inside, well, then you probably wouldn't be able to know which one of the two it had belonged to. So uh, this is with a name and a family name. So imagine when you only have a family name, like I said, except if it's an extremely uncommon name, well, then it usually could match dozens or hundreds of people, and then you don't know who it belongs to. So when I was a kid, I went to, to holidays in Digne, which is in southern France. And this shows the, a map of the invasion of southern France that happened on August 15, 1944. And Digne is here, and uh, it was liberated four days after the invasion. And when I was there, I was visiting some people on a farm, uh, and uh, we were talking about the war, and they said, oh, you know, there's a German helmet and a German gas mask down in the basement. And they were really nice, and they brought me down to the basement, and uh, the helmet was uh, here, and the gas mask was hanging on this thing for wine bottles. And they just gave it to me, the, both the things. So this is what they look like. And uh, first we're going to talk about the helmet. So you can see, the first thing you see on this helmet is that it has this wire going around, this string that looks kind of messy. And you can wonder what that's supposed to be for. So during World War II, camouflage was still kind of experimental. Now, it wasn't issued to all soldiers. And helmets were painted green or gray or black to be like not too visible. But they usually didn't have any kind of uh, camouflage covers or things like that. So soldiers would improvise. And uh, so they would add on uh, nets or strings uh, to be able to, to put camouflage on their helmet. And this is a picture from Nice. And you can uh, vaguely see that all three guys uh, put some kind of net on their helmets. This is another picture uh, from the Nice area. And from far away, you don't notice anything, but then if you zoom and look from close up, you can see that this guy has some kind of uh, string on his helmet, similar to the, it's actually very similar to the, the one on the helmet that was given to me in Digne. And then this guy also has some kind of string on his helmet. And this is a grave of a German soldier uh, near Nice, and you can see very nicely that he put what we call the chicken wire on his helmet. And the point of all that was to be able to do what this soldier did, to add vegetation uh, onto the helmet to be camouflaged. And you'll, you'll notice that this guy actually has a camouflage uniform because he's an SS soldier, and the SS were, were more advanced than the German army, and uh, they had lots of camouflage uniforms when, uh, at the end of the war. So um, in practice, these are helmets that were found in the, in the Nice region. And you can see that this one has some kind of uh, metallic wire uh, going around it that was improvised by the soldier. This helmet has one of those chicken wires that was also improvised by the soldier. This is another one also with a chicken wire. So what's interesting with these helmets is that, you know, they're made, they were made in the millions in factories. And what I find very interesting to see is when the human being 
modifies his, let's say, industrially made equipment. And this is a very nice example, seeing how soldiers would take these, uh, take these pieces of wire and then uh, add those on their helmets. So it's, let's say, a little trace of humanity on these, uh, on these war relics. And another thing that's interesting is that nowadays German helmets can cost uh, hundreds of dollars and um, collectors love it when they have these camouflage things on them and when they do have one of these nets or wires that literally makes them two times more expensive for the collector's market. And so of course uh, <laughs> it's not very difficult to add this on a helmet so lots of fakers uh, put these wires on the helmets to try to sell the helmet for, for more expensive. And I think if the soldiers in 1944 had known that simply adding a piece of wire on a helmet would make it cost a thousand dollars more, they would probably have gotten a big kick out of that. <laughs> and um, not only did the Germans had to improvise, these show American paratroopers, so people who are usually uh, very nicely equipped, but they also didn't have camouflage uniforms. So here, here you see that they're actually spray painting themselves in camouflaged colors. And this is what, the, what it looks like, the result. And uh, I was lucky to find a very nice helmet with these uh, remains of uh, camouflage paint in southern France, the Marvin Moles helmet. And if you want to know more about it, you can watch my video I made about Marvin Moles' helmet. So let's get back to the, to the Digne helmet. So um, it has this wire going all around it, as you can see. This is what it looks like from on top. And when you look from close up, you can see that it's, uh, I'm saying wire because it's actually an electric wire, you see, with uh, cloth isolation like they sometimes had back then. And uh, lucky thing, it's a metal wire, otherwise it wouldn't have uh, survived, it would have fallen to pieces uh, in the meantime. And then it has this eagle on it, which, uh, which is the eagle for the German army. The Air Force had a different eagle, the SS had a different badge on their helmets. So this is normal, the Germans uh, like to have eagles everywhere, as we'll see again in a minute. This is the inside of the helmet, and you can see that, unfortunately, there's no name in it anywhere. So there's no way of being able to, to identify this soldier. It's just a helmet with no name. The one detail you can see, though, is that on the chin strap, it has a date from 1941. Now let's see the gas mask. So some of you might be wondering why I'm calling this thing a gas mask. I remember when I was a kid and I saw war movies, I was wondering what this tin can is that the German soldiers always have. It looked kind of cool, I thought. And uh, actually, this is a tin can with their gas mask inside it. And it still has all these straps for carrying it. And uh, this strap, I'd, I've never seen anywhere else, and I've asked collectors if they know what it is, and nobody's been able to identify it. So if anybody knows what this strap is for, you can uh, post a comment on the, on the video. So when you open the gas mask, this is what it looks like. And uh, let's look from closer. So first thing, you can see it's from uh, 1941, just like the helmet. Then it has this uh, eagle stamp. Uh, this was like some kind of a quality control inspection stamp. And like I said, the Germans loved having, uh, having eagles all over the place during World War II. They even had them on their ammunition. These are shell fragments, and if you look from close up, you can see that even the, the shell had a little eagle and swastika on it. So if anybody in Hollywood is listening to this video, I have a good idea of a scenario for you next time you make a war movie. Have a soldier be wounded by shrapnel, and when the surgeon removes a piece of shrapnel, he sees that there's an eagle and swastika on it. That would be a pretty cool scene, I think. So let's get back to the gas mask. Um, as you can see, it also has a name inside it. And gas masks were something important. Uh, they existed in three sizes. And then uh, each soldier had to set the mask so that it was his exact size. So since everybody had his mask uh, with his size and his settings, and since the mask was something very important in case there was a gas attack, so that they wouldn't get mixed up, uh, the gas masks almost always have names written inside them, which of course is great for people like me who like to do research. So this, this one here, see, has the name Gef, means Gefreite, Corporal, and then the family name is Monshausen. And this is very good news, because Monshausen is an extremely, extremely rare name. You can figure out how rare names are, for example, by looking them up in the German phone book. And when I looked this name in the German phone book, there was only one person listed in all of Germany. So that means that there's not very many, and there's good chances of perhaps uh, being able to identify this guy.
So what I did is I paid a researcher in Berlin to go to the archives and to look up all the people who were called Monshausen uh, in World War II. And uh, I was lucky because uh, he said there's only three guys who served in the German army with that name, Monshausen. And I told him I was interested in, in a guy who was in France. And he said that the correct one is probably this one here, Nicolas Monshausen, Nicolaus Monshausen. And um, this is the guy's story. So it says that he was in, uh, in a hospital in Bordeaux, France at some point in 1941. It says in 1942 he was uh, wounded in the, in the left leg and was in hospital in, uh, in Paris. And then, the very interesting part, it says that in uh, southern France he, came, he became a prisoner of war of the Americans in Aigne, which of course is a mistake. Uh, it should say Din here. And uh, the guy was also in a unit, Landeschutze Bataillon 625, that was uh, located in the Din area. So I have the gas mask given to me in Digne, uh, where the people picked it up at the end of the war, and it has the name Monshausen, and there's only three Monshausens who served in the German army, and one of them is known to have been captured in Digne. This is about as good as, as a result that you can get for, for research, where everything matches nicely, and let's say that now we know beyond a reasonable doubt that this gas mask would have belonged uh, to Nicolas Monshausen. And I don't know if it's his helmet too, both of them are from 1941, but it's probably just a helmet that was lying on the street after the fighting and maybe it's his, maybe it's not his. And the way I could know that is maybe by finding a picture of him where he could be wearing that helmet. And this is where the research unfortunately becomes inconclusive because I wrote to this guy's hometown and uh, I wrote to the person called Munchausen in the German phone book and nobody ever responded even though I sent multiple letters, so maybe they're, they're not related or anyway, nobody wanted to... Uh, to, to reply to me and, uh, and give me any extra information, so that's unfortunate. And as a little side note, uh, gas masks often have a number written on them, and I don't know what the number corresponds to, but this is an interesting case because some people think that it's the ID tag number that was painted on, and uh, here you can see that the guy's ID tag number was 33, so obviously it's not the ID tag number that was used, or at least not in all cases. So to conclude, I was saying that researching German names is usually not possible. In this case, there's several things that enabled the research to be, to be done. The first thing is that the name is extremely rare. The second thing is that I know the context of where the mask was found. And thanks to that, I'm able to find out who it belonged to. Imagine if I had found this mask in a flea market, for example, in the, in the US, where it would have been brought back by an American veteran. Well, then I wouldn't be able to know who it had belonged to because I would have no way of knowing which one of these three Monshausens it would have belonged to. But since I know where it was found and that matches the location where one guy was captured, well, now I know that that was his mask. So I hope you found this interesting and see you in the next video. And as usual, if uh, any of you guys want help to do some kind of similar research, uh, feel free to contact me. I'm, I'm always happy to help if I can.